So, we heard quite some uh, interesting proposals, interesting digital tools, things already happening. And uh, let's start with the first question, which is kind of a question about evolution. Uh, let's say a smartphone, most people didn't have a smartphone five years ago, uh, ten years ago, not everybody was on the internet, so things are moving quite fast. How have you seen politics changing through this uh, yeah, wave of digitalization? Uh, so that's maybe an interesting question to start. Uh, you are in politics and you see society changing. What has this meant for politics? Please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first, I just want to thank you for inviting me. It's really fun to be here. Um, and uh, I think it's really interesting to follow the people who have actually been talking about this interesting stuff that they're doing. And then I'm supposed to come here and say that we need to do the stuff that they're saying that they're actually doing. So that's really fun. Um, but yeah, um, so first we might start with thinking of how it was before the internet. I guess the society has changed a lot less 20 years. Obviously, before we had a lack of information, and that was the problem. So we were kind of forced to put all our, our trust in politicians. Uh, and these politicians had the documents available that they needed to do enlightened uh, decision making. And the, and the general public kind of just had to blindly trust them for that decision making. And um, I, uh, well, at least in Iceland, media was very much controlled by the political parties and by people uh, with money. So that was also a problem. So it was kind of, yeah, the lack of information uh, that also made uh, this uh, very representative form of democracy uh, the way we did politics. And obviously we still have that today, but it is developing a thing and, ch think and changing um, to a more direct form of democracy. So, um, yeah, and obviously when you're choosing a politician, it's kind of just choosing the best out of many evils, right? So you're never going to 100% agree on what a politician has to say. You just have to kind of trust that person to do their best and, and try to take care of your interest or the public interest. But obviously, you're never going to be 100% happy. So um, you also had these strong parties, very elitist parties, complex structures, uh, a lot of hierarchy. And um, and it was really difficult to climb. You got into a political party, and uh, the people that were able to climb the system were often the people who weren't really necessarily the people who had the best ideas, but had other good qualities. So whereas today you have more information available, uh, obviously you have this di digitalization of documents that makes it easier for journalists to do their work in democracy. Um, and uh, you have yeah these documents that are machine readable and the general public that can then in a more effective way um, um, take part of the political conversation for from a day-to-day -day basis so uh, that's obviously the big step the big change that people get can get more involved and you have these tools obviously you both have the information you have the tools you have these petitions online voting, online discussion, so that has changed a lot. But then again, we see that we have uh, this problem or this democratic crisis that people call it, that people are not showing up at the polling stations uh, when, when there's elections. And um, I have been uh, kind of thinking, I've been thinking about this quite a lot as being the leader of a youth party and it's especially young people who are not showing up. And I kind of came to the, uh, this thought that uh, maybe we should take that dilemma and turn it upside down because people not showing up are often the people who uh, don't trust the corrupt politicians and uh, they don't like the system the way it is. Like we have a system where you, you show up every four years, you vote, and then you're supposed to blindly trust the people. But as that is the old system. And I think young people today just want the, a new system. They want uh, these other forms of uh, being involved in the democracy to be counting more than it is. Okay, yeah. thank you. Ima, do you recognize yourself in this picture? Uh, I do for a part, um, especially for the last part where we see the turnout for uh, young people and uh, the lack of trust in, in uh, politics. I think it was uh, the uh, um, serve from uh, 
city uh, lab uh, that showed the presentation of 83% is not trust in uh, politics. Um, that is definitely the case for youngsters. But I think everybody is politically involved. But that doesn't mean that they don't uh, that they do trust their, uh, the political system. So I think it's not because people do not trust the political powers that are that they are not politically involved. I think that's one really big difference, and that's what you notice when you go uh, speak in schools uh, with a lot of young people, or, or when you uh, have uh, when I have young people visiting the parliament where uh, where my desk is, and you talk with them. Everybody has an opinion about public transport. Everybody has an opinion about their school, about their uh, 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 about healthcare, about how their sports club is organized. Um, but they do not have interest in the traditional political system, the political party. So I think there's a a big gap between those two things, and I think we have to nourish that political feeling that youngsters have. And uh, the whole digitalization is one uh, uh, tool that we can that can help us realize that. I think th the most important thing when you talk about uh, digitalization and the effect of it is that, in my opinion, dig uh, digitalization is not something, uh, it's a neutral thing. It's not a positive or negative thing. It is positive or negative that depends on what you do with it and how you use it. It's like this mic. I can use this mic to, to, to let you hear my voice saying positive things and how we can change things and come together, or I can use it to, to, to do hate speech and, and turn people uh, against one each other. It's not the fault of the mic, it's uh, the fault of the people who's holding it and the message he's bringing. And I think the same thing goes for uh, digitalization. If you ask me how, does, uh, how has it changed politics, I can give you two examples from uh, a negative point of view and a positive point of view. In the city where I live, uh, you see that a lot of uh, um, public services have been cut down. And the city council has said it's, uh, it is to become more efficient. You know, it's going to cost us less and we're going to be more efficient. Which sounds good, right? I mean, who can be against that? But when you go see to the reality what really happens in, in the city of Antwerp, you see that a lot of public services have been cut. There are no more discs where all people can go, where people who are not digitally organized can go to and, 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 and get help. But everything has been uh, uh, reduced to an internet website. So there is no more office when you can come in and ask, I have a problem with my ID card, or I don't know what I have to do with, with uh, X or Y. No, you have to go to a website, and on that website you have to make an appointment, and then you have to wait until three, four days before you can go to that appointment. And then, So the whole thing has become way more complex. It is not a good thing to help politics get closer to people. It is actually more an excuse for austerity. But people are using it as, yeah, that's a good thing for this. So that's a negative point of view. A positive point of view is we are, uh, the Green Party in Belgium, we are like a, ba uh, a basic democratic party, so all our members have uh, the power, actually. So uh, our political uh, uh, points of view are being decided by our, me by our members. Who is going to be uh, on a list for elections it be is being decided by our members. Mm -hmm. And now we are taking the step also digitally. So we have uh, created a platform where everybody can see how things are being, uh, uh, how the thinking, me as a member of parliament, people can see how I uh, work with my, uh, uh, with my staff and, and, and the people in my, uh, in my uh, fraction on certain things and why we take some decisions and how do we move forward and people can react to that. And I think that's a really vulnerable thing to do because you let a lot of people see in the work that you're doing on, 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 a, on a certain delicate matter. But I think that's a good thing. I think that's a positive way how you can bring politics closer to people. So that is the digitalization. It can be a positive thing if you get more people involved in politics and it can be a negative thing if you use it uh, as an excuse for austerity or other things. So I think that's the thing that we uh, have to keep in mind. And one more thing, uh, if I may, about smartphones, because you start with that. It also reminds me of a, a, a negative example. We have public transport in the city where I come from and there was an action uh, that said, okay, we're going to uh, change the ticketing system. You can uh, order a ticket by SMS, by text. It's going to cost you, I don't know the exact prices, but it's going to cost you one euro fifty. But if you do it by, the, by a mobile app, it's going to cost you only one euro. And everybody has a mobile app right now, so that's a good thing. But then they did the research, and 90% of the people has a, has a, a, a cell phone, but only 50% of the people has a smartphone. So you're punishing like a lot of people by making something cheaper, just because they don't have a smartphone, maybe because they don't have money to afford a smartphone, maybe because they don't want to have a smartphone, so why are you doing that just from a different point of view? So that's, that are, those are things that we have to think about when we're using digitalization in a political uh, point of okay. view. Okay, let's move back to the political party you're active in. Uh, the Pirate Party is, is quite known for organizing itself in the digital way 
uh, maybe you can just explain how does it work if you want to have a congress with your party and how can people uh, participate i think uh, online uh, and offline yeah um yes that's kind of uh our thing, trying to get people involved uh, online. Um, and we have different ways of doing this. Uh, in Iceland, we have uh, this online voting system. So uh, all our policies are made online by the members, basically. First, we actually have offline meetings uh, and we discuss the policy and it's developed through a, a series of meetings. And then at a certain point, uh, it's voted on. And if the meeting, the people in the meetings uh, agree on that this, it's a good draft, it's sent to the voting system. And uh, there it is for a period of time and there, there you can discuss it and it's introduced and then at a certain point it's going to be voted on. So By the members of the party? Yes, hmm. yes. So then we need at least 50% uh, of the people voting, voting for the policy. So uh, it's very, very open. And that's also uh, a challenge for us now. We're, we're a new party, we're very young, so we're always trying to figure out how to do things in a better way. And now we're kind of thinking of maybe that we may, might need to change the system a little bit because now we have so many policies that it's uh, maybe a limitation for how representative it is for the people's actual opinions in some ways. Like It's not many uh, examples of this, but we, it obviously needs to be very connected to the members. Maybe you can give one example. So you say we are dealing with several policy fields, but are you saying that f some policy fields, the members are not really interested, so there's only little engagement? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, exactly. And um, uh, the way it is today, you kind of only need three people uh, that are coming together in a meeting that can send something to the voting system. But it can obviously be stopped in the voting system, so it's not really a problem. And it's really important for us, that the threshold for making policy and for getting engaged is really low, so that's a really important principle of ours. But it, we have to find that right balance, you know. Because um, if five people that don't like your party become member and they start drafting strange proposals, <laughs> yeah, we well, obviously that's always uh, always um, the thing that that can happen. But so far, it hasn't happened. And uh, we kind of just embrace all, uh, all the interest we get. Uh, so it's not really a big problem. But we also have an online discussion forum. Mm -hmm. So uh, ideas are often developed there before they go to these meetings. Uh, and we also have a Facebook group, which is quite large. Uh, it's it independent of us now, but it used to be our Facebook group until some trolls came in and tried to ruin it. And they uh, yeah, they pretend trolls. damn trolls, yeah. They pretended that they were pirates and try they were trying to kind of um, false pirates. Yeah, false. We have problems with false pirates around, yeah. So, uh, but w it still exists. It's still uh, called with our name, the Pirate Chat or Pirate Aspetl in Icelandic. Uh, and there's a lot of political discussions there, general political discussions. And our representatives are there, or many of them, and they are engaging in conversation with the general public. So that's also something that I found very, very charming about the Pirate Party, that the representatives want to be so connected to the members and, and you can easily engage in a conversation with them. They want to know what you think about things. And that's very, and it's not just like on a theoretical level, it's on a practical level. Okay. They really try to be connected. Imade, Green Party in Belgium, Flanders, uh, they're also investing in having more digital interaction. There's a Congress uh, later this year. How is this going to take shape, this digital interaction? Well, before I say that, uh, I just want to add one little thing about the question that you asked about what if five people uh, become member of your page and they, are, they have another opinion. I mean, it's, it's a good question, but for instance, Jeremy Corbyn, United Kingdom, has become president of his uh, Labour Party uh, a few months ago or a good year ago. And you had the same problem there. There were a lot of people of other parties. Uh, there was being said there were a lot of people from other parts, uh, parties registering to vote and to get uh, Jeremy Corbyn elected as president because they thought that would uh, give the Tories a better chance to, you know, <laughs> defeat the Labour Party. There was a lot of discussion going on about that. There was also the discussion in France when you uh, can uh, choose the, uh, 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 the the candidate uh, uh, for the presidency uh, with a different party. Every every French 
men who has a, a, an electoral card can go vote. So we have the same, it's not a problem of digitalization, just a problem that you have in a political democratic system that there can also always be other people who are trying to interfere and, 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 and work against your, your system. So I don't think it's just a question of, of uh, digitalization. Um, but to answer about, uh, your question about how uh, <laughs> we are going to work. Now we have a Congress uh, um, uh, the 17th and 18th of November. Uh, and it's going to be, and that's really interesting, about uh, the role between governments and civil society and citizens and how they can uh, um, affect or uh, also uh, uh, decide during a period between two elections. Because I think one of the biggest uh, misconceptions about democracy is that people think, or some colleague politicians think, that an election is the people who give their democratic voice or their democratic power to you for five years and then afterwards you have to uh, give it back. No, that's not the case. An election is the democratic power still stays with the people, but you get a megaphone or a mic to speak louder, but the power is still with them. So it's not like they don't have to say anything to say until five years or four years or two years when the next election comes. So what we're going to try to do with that Congress is we're going to... Um, uh, get a lot of people together to think offline and online. What are we going to do? Uh, we're going to gather um, uh, with, uh, in, in all the small cities where we're active in Flanders with groups of people, members and non-members, to discuss uh, around uh, 11 uh, debates about the role of government, uh, citizen, uh, civil society and citizens about how they can influence each other. We're going to do that offline. Uh, we're going to do that uh, um, in, a, in a really dynamic way with a lot of discussion. Uh, you know, there's a lot of ways to discuss and, and get the, the, the discussions going. We're also going to do that online simultaneously. Uh, we have a, 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 a wiki site that we have created where you can uh, interact with each other, where you can get an account and you can discuss with each other. It's all real transparent. Everybody can see all the discussions about all the different teams that's going on. You can join some uh, point of views, like them as well. So in that way, it's a little bit like the Sidim, but not even close because you guys are way further than, uh, than <laughs> we are. I, I, I have no shame of saying that at all. Um, and, and so you go, you're going to have both ways. You're going to have the digital way and the offline way. Uh, and then you're going to bring them all together. Uh, so they're like different etapes. The first is a discussion. The second one is drafting the texts. Everybody's going to do that. Then you're going to vote about the text. And then you can uh, give uh, remarks about the texts. And then you're going with the texts and the remarks about the text to the Congress, the 17th and 18th uh, of November. And then all the members, because only members can vote. Uh, Non-members can discuss, but only members can vote. I think that's a logical thing. Uh, we're going to have the discussion the 17th and 18th, and then you can defend why uh, you think uh, that uh, a certain text that is being uh, uh, presented has to change or is unacceptable or acceptable. And then all our members will uh, vote per subtext of the whole text, whether we're going to accept or not that text. So it's like a really participative way that we always have with the Green Party. And uh, it is simultaneously the thing that makes me the most proud of my party and also that gives me the most gray hair. Uh, because it's really... It's quite okay. Yeah, yeah, well, I'm only 33 years old and I already have a lot of gray hairs. But because it's a really uh, a pure democratic debate and I really love it and I'm proud of my party of it. But it also means that you have to make time for that. And sometimes people forget to make time for that. I mean, I like making time for it, but it also sometimes means that you have to explain the same thing six times or seven times. <laughs> and still people are going to say, but I just don't agree. Okay, that's your false right. It's not about agreeing. It's just about uh, uh, getting a majority and a consensus about certain things. And, and it's a nice thing to do, actually. Okay. Um, I just want, since you're talking about like things that you're doing that you're really proud of, I want to mention a couple that I'm really proud of. Because I'm also working temporarily now in the European Parliament for the Pirate there. That's why I'm here. Uh, and uh, there we have something called lobby call. That is, uh, you talked about transparency earlier, and that's really a big part of this digitalization and the e-democracy, obviously, opening up the power uh, for the people uh, general public and uh, lobby call is something that we use for registering all the lobby meetings of Julia Reda who is the pirate representative MEP uh, just to make make it available for people and we're encouraging uh, members of the Green Party which we are a part of to use it as well as some are doing that and trying to spread the news of, of using that so that's a really really cool cool thing and uh, we, ha we have a pirate in the city council of Reykjavik now and we and he has been pushing for opening up the city budget. So the city budget of Reykjavik has been opened now, and it's uh, and that was just implemented a few weeks ago. And it's not only uh, open and available, it's also published as raw data. So it's machine readable, 
and um, unprocessed, so it's very open and, uh, and easy for journalists to actually use that to find to dig into it and, and find the information. So I'm very proud of that. So <laughs> okay, uh, we're moving to the end. I think let's have a look at the future. Society is changing quite fast. Imagine within 10 years, big election, you're number one on the list. How do you conceive your digital campaign? <laughs> I, I, yeah, I don't uh, always ask easy questions. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> how my campaign will be. Yeah, of, of the campaign of your party. How do you yeah, think society has been, yeah. has been yeah, still changed and is changing and how powerful uh, digital tools will be or will be the will be necessary or mm -hmm. uh, that's a good question obviously I can only uh, answer as an idealist and hope that something will happen because I'm trying to push for that and um, what we see happening now and what I hope continues and, and that we can kind of uh, support and make be reality is this power shift from the old parties these hierarchical uh, old institutions to the general citizens. So, um, because I uh, we have all this technology today, we have all these possibilities, but it's the responsibility of people in politics, especially and people who are in place of doing something about it, of of, of implementing it and making it happen. So, um, I um, like for example in Iceland we had a huge financial crisis you might have heard of that not only in Iceland but <laughs> it's okay <laughs> well it was uh, kind of huge there a big problem and after that we started writing a new constitution and in that well it was never adopted because we got a new government who kind of fucked it up that's great uh, but uh, that's kind of a big thing for us in the part party that was one of our biggest platforms for the last uh, election that was uh, getting the constitution uh, adopted and one uh, and a couple of things in this constitution is something that would help this and one of it is that 10 percent of the public can uh, ask for a referendum on a law that has been passed through parliament and uh, our second one is that two percent of the public can demand something to be discussed in the parliament so these kind of structures need to be built up for the citizens to become empowered uh, and I think that's kind of what we have to be doing now. And I saw earlier, like, there's a lot of people doing that already, but we have to kind of support that and make that happen. And uh, and then what might happen is uh, the parties would probably change, hopefully. Uh, the ones that wouldn't change probably disappear, hopefully. Um, so uh, the parties obviously should open up and change in a way that the power becomes less hierarchical and less pyramid and more maybe circular in a way so that everyone gets space uh, because everyone has a voice now and um, and that the others would disappear and that um, so what could be the result of that we could have co-creation of laws obviously like now we are making laws through the parties it goes through a long process and it's very far away from a general citizen. But if we are able to make these structures, these systems, this hardware that is needed to do this, we can have many people working on the laws so that obviously many heads are better than one. So I think that could improve the lawmaking. Laws are just the maps of our societies. So the citizens should be more involved. And the law tax is obviously really complicated and you kind of need to be a lawyer to understand the laws, which is a huge problem. But maybe slowly we could kind of debug that and make them okay. more available and better, obviously. That's a nice uh, view of the future. Co-creation <laughs> co of the law. <laughs> Idealist, I said. No, no. <laughs> yeah. well, first of all, uh, if I... Um, going to be number one on the list in 10 years, I'm going to hire those two guys <laughs> <laughs> and all the other people who spoke because I think that's going to help me a lot. Uh, uh, but I, the thing is why I laughed when you asked the question is because in 10 years, I mean, things are going so fast right now that I really can't even imagine where we'll be in 10 years uh, in, in terms of uh, the, the applications going to be uh, available and, and the things, how they're going to evolve. I do not know that. All I know is that there's a lot of possibilities right now. And I think we have seen that today uh, because of digitalization. But I really 
do not want to politic that politics or democracy becomes something only digital. I think dem a democracy or a political system is a strong, uh, th the more people get involved, the stronger the political chain and democratic chain. And there will always be people who are not inside of the whole digital uh, 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 eco ecosystem. So you have to have a combination of offline and online. Obviously, everybody agrees on that. But I think uh, we cannot forget that as politicians. We just had uh, a communication with our friends uh, from the Green Party in the Netherlands who just had elections there. And they had a really great uh, campaign. And the thing is, they had a really good online campaign which was really dynamic and offensive and positive. But it also had, a, and, and not a lot of people know that, they also had a really crazy offline campaign. They visited a lot of people. They went outside, they knocked on doors, they talked to people outside. Their motto was not screaming, but talking. So they got, they got involved with people. They talked, with, not to convince people, obviously you want to convince people to vote for you, uh, and they succeeded quite well, but uh, you also want to connect with people because you want everybody to know that their vote matters. When I talk with young people once again, or older people, because I also talk with older people, um, and you talk about politics, for me it's not about them voting for me. I want them to vote for me, but for me it's to be uh, uh, engaged and vote for other people. Find out which political party you like, and if you don't like anyone, start a movement yourself or, 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 or go think outside a box and do something. Uh, and I think that has to be a combination of offline and online, because I think one of the dangers that we have um, uh, with, with the online thing and the whole digitalization that you create a new gap. That you create a new gap of those who can follow and those who cannot follow. And I think a lot of the uh, democratic uh, crises that we're having right now in Western Europe, but also the Western world is that we have created uh, a, a gap due to the last industrialization, the third industri uh, industrial wave of the haves and the have nots, the people who can follow and the people who cannot follow. And I think if we wanna succeed in this whole industrialization 4.0, and the digitalization, the robotization of our uh, 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 labor market and our society, we have to make sure that we do not leave people behind as we have done in the past industrialization waves where we created a lot about uh, uh, profits and, 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 and we left uh, the ecological and the social um, uh, goals behind. And I think that is the most important thing. I would say thank you very much for formulating conclusions for this <laughs> afternoon. You were reading my mind, I guess, but that's very good. So no, it's a little bit scary, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you don't, you don't know, but uh, the last generation of chips, you don't feel them anymore. No, I think we had a, a marvelous uh, afternoon with several perspectives. I think it's clear on the one hand that the system we have already for 200 years of representative democracy and uh, needs some. Uh, a change, we have to move to more participatory democracy, citizens really want to be involved, and for that, I think digital tools, they're only tools, but if we uh, make them in a good way, which means inclusive, which means transparent, uh, so they are, can be used to have fair discussions and fair conclusions, we are not only uh, modernizing democracy, but also uh, making it stronger. So I think this is this kind of uh, path we are walking, eh? because it was clear that predicting what will happen within 10 years, it's, it's, it's interesting to see that it's very difficult. So I think we are, it's a path we are developing to a more inclusive and more digital democracy, which have been debated. So I want to thank all the speakers and all the public here. And of course, we have a little drink outside. Thank you.